Hello students of statics, this is Dr. Dan Baker and today's video we are going to combine a couple of topics which we covered previously to solve a new type of problem. Okay, so we're going to look at distributed loads. Now we talked about distributed loads way back in chapter two. As we talked about, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of forces. And to this point in class, we've only covered point forces, right? We've assumed that everything's a point force and we you know, basically created a numeric system to solve for these point forces. So it turns out that we're going to stick with that general system, but I'm going to teach you how to turn a distributed load into a point load. Okay, so distributed loads essentially is going to combine two different topics. It's going to combine equilibrium and centroids. All right, so if we have a beam, and remember a beam is a structural member which carries loads in by bending, and we have a pin over here at the left end, let's put a roller on the right end, and we put a distributed load, okay? So a distributed load is a load that is spread out over space. Okay, so this is a constant value distributed load. So now when I say distributed load, the common term is distributed load versus distributed force, but realize that all of these loads that I'm talking about are forces. And if we looked at the way these are expressed, they're expressed as a load per length. Okay, kind of like a, a linear density. Okay, so it would be, say, in pounds per foot or in newtons per meter. Okay, a load per length. And so I mentioned our goal here is to create an externally equivalent system. So we're going to create a externally equivalent. Now keep in mind that externally is not looking at the internal stress and strain on the beam, but just the external effects like the reactions. And so here's our same beam, and I'll create a externally equivalent free body diagram. Let's go ahead and start with our reactions. We have the pin on the left end, which provides two components, one horizontal, one vertical. We had a roller on the right end, provides one vertical component. So now what we're going to do with this distributed load, if you think about the units here, right, we have like a load per length, and of course there's going to be some length to that distributed load. So looking at those units, you could look and say, oh, if I multiply my length times my load per length, I'm gonna get a load. And fundamentally, if you think of what you're doing there, you're really finding the area under this distributed load, okay? So the area, and fundamentally that area becomes the magnitude of the equivalent point force. Okay, so I'm going to put this force is equal to the area. And it's going to be located at the centroid of that area, right? So the centroid here for a rectangle is going to be half of the base, half of the height. So I could draw over here that the distance, I didn't quite get this drawn to scale, but I could call this the length divided by two because it's a rectangle or you also from our table we tended to use base over two okay so pretty simple function the magnitude of a distributed load is the area under the load and then the location is through the centroid let me add that centroid point here okay passing through the centroid now we don't typically have to worry about where the vertical coordinate of the centroid because forces lie on a line of action right keep in mind the line of action of this force looks like this and so I could grab a hold of this force and put it anywhere I wanted on that line of action I could put it up here I could put way up here so being able to slide that force on this line of action makes the vertical location of the centroid not really matter for a vertical load 
right? You can also have horizontal loads. Um, these would come into play if you're in the civil, if you're in civil engineering. Um, wind loads are very often computed as a horizontal load uh, against the face of a building. Um, wind actually is often assumed to increase linearly from the ground going up. Fundamentally, in any fluid flow, the velocity at a surface is zero. But you'll learn more about that in fluids. All right, so to write out the steps for replacing a distributed load with an externally equivalent load. Okay, so these steps to replace a distributed load with a externally equivalent point force. Now you will see in some textbooks, instead of calling this an externally equivalent point force, they may call this a resultant force, right? Remember that resultant means the sum of, and so it's the same kind of idea that we are finding the sum of the distributed load, which is equal to the area underneath it. So we have step number one is to find the area under the distributed load. And these are most commonly rectangles and triangles. Um, you could have other shapes um, and you actually technically can apply even the integral functions that I presented in the centroids video. If you had an equation that was like W, which is load as a function of X, you actually take the first moment integral in the top divided by the total in the bottom. Anyways, find that, um, which is the number two here, that distance to the centroid. Okay, so find the area under the distributed load. Then we are going to find the centroid of the distributed load three we're going to pass our equivalent point force through the centroid And then four would be to solve with our equations of equilibrium. So solve with those equations of equilibrium, noting that every single free body diagram that you solve in statics you solve the same way with the equations of equilibrium. You establish an axis system in your free body diagram. You write your equations. You solve for unknowns. Okay, so that process never changes across any of the topics. All right, so let's go ahead and work through an example so you can kind of see the workflow on one of these problems. Feel free to pause the video to get the problem drawn out. So on this problem, we have a beam. This beam has a total length of 4.3 meters, if you add together those three subdimensions there. Okay, so 4.3 meters. And there are two distributed loads, one over the first 1.8 meters, a constant value of 200 newtons per meter, and then another one which has a maximum value of 225 newtons per meter and it decreases down here to zero newtons per meter right so just note that that newtons per meter is not a slope it is the distributed load value if we were to come up with the slope of this curve and let me also just emphasize here so if i just draw the, the right end Another way you can draw these distributed loads, and this can become valuable as we get into a future topic, which is coming up next, called shear and moment, is that realize you also could draw this, this force like this, 
right? So essentially taking that all, this distributed load and sliding each incremental value coming across the width of it here down along its line of action, you could end up with this slope right here because fundamentally this slope is going downward, right? And so as we establish an axis system on our free body diagram, you could find out that this, you know, this is negative 225 newtons per meter. And so if we look at the overall slope to this curve, and we know that slope is rise over run. And so the slope is equal to rise over run. And so we're starting at negative 225, we're going up to zero, right? So we have a total rise of 225 newtons per meter. That's over a run of 1.5 meters. And so it turns out that our slope is equal to 150, okay? So this is going to be 150, and this is meters as well, right? So this is newtons per meter squared. So if you're asked to find the slope of it, and you wanted to find that, um, you still can find the value, right? Realize that because essentially here, like I said, we're at negative 225 here, we're at zero. And so we can figure out the rise, the change in the value of that distributed load is a positive 225 divided by its overall length. And that matches up, right? We think about a positive slope going up to the right. So we got a positive slope for that function. Okay, so that contrast to if you're looking at over here, you might visualize that as a negative slope. Okay, so just something to watch for. Often easier to push these vectors so that their tails are on the beam than their tips. Okay, but like I said, that's just kind of looking forward, something to be handy for the next topic. But in general, we want to find the areas, right? So the area of this first one is 200 times 1.8, so 3. 60, the meters will cancel in that multiplication, so 360 newtons. The area of my next one here, 225 times 1.5 divided by 2, right? One half base over height. We could find that this area here is equal to 168.75 newtons. Okay, so those are my two areas. And then I'll pass those through the centroids, right? So the centroid of a rectangle is half of the base. The centroid of a triangle is one third from any face. Okay, so it's gonna be one third from this face over here. So 1.5 divided by three. So basically from here to here will be 0 0.5 and from here to here will be 0 0.9, okay? So to bring this information together, we can then draw a free body diagram. Okay, this is what we need to solve the problem, is a free body diagram. We have not drawn one yet, right? This is really more the problem sketch with some notes above it. So we have our external unknowns, which we're gonna solve for our reactions, AX, AY, BY. I have, and if you want to, often it's a good habit to be in on these. You can draw one below the other and kind of bring information down. So I have one force here equal to 360 newtons. That's from the rectangular load. I have another force of 168.75. And these are going to be located, this one, as we mentioned, 0 0.9 meters. This one, I'm gonna measure everything from the left end because I'm gonna add some moments about that end. Okay, so this is gonna be 3.3 meters. And then we had a total distance over to BY of 4.3 meters, okay? So there is my free body diagram of this distributed load, I now can solve for those reactions, summing force in the x direction. There's only one force in the x, which is ax, so that must equal zero. That one was quick and easy. So in some of the forces in the y direction, we have a y minus 360 minus 168.75 plus by equals zero. Two unknowns there. That's my moment equation. 
move over to here as far as I can, leave myself some room, sum of moments about A. I have a distance of 0 0.9 times 360. And that is going to be negative from the right-hand rule, traveling from A, traveling from A over here to 360. Write R into F, your thumb should go into the screen. So that is negative from the right-hand rule. And then another distance here from A, 3.3 over to the value of 168.75. This is also negative from the right-hand rule. And then the last term is going to be positive from the right-hand rule. You drop down to the next line, uh, 4.3 meters times my unknown V sub Y, and that is equal to zero. So from this equation, we can find that dy is equal to a value of 204.85 newtons. And then substituting that back into my sum of the force in the y equation, I can solve that ay is equal to 323.895 newtons. Okay, so there are my three reaction components for this beam. Okay, once again, the process, I work to understand what these distributed loads were, were all about, what their maximum values were. I then found the areas under these distributed loads, noting that the values here of 225 newton meters is not the slope. We actually found the slope to this function to be 150 newton meters. Um, but we found the area underneath. We found each centroid. Um, both those equations you could find centroidal distance and also area under um, those shapes you could find from your centroidal table from your composite parts. We then applied those externally equivalent loads to our beam. We then um, had a free body diagram, which we could apply our equations of equilibrium and solve for our unknowns. So we'll be using distributed loads as we move forward into the next chapter, looking at now the internal effects of these distributed loads. But in order to find the internal effects, we need to solve for all of the external effects first. So basically we need to be able to solve for this a sub x, b sub y, and a sub y before we look inside um, at what's going on with the internal, what we call shear, moment, and axial load. And so those will be coming up in the next video. Hope you're having a great day.